do is just focus for the, for the next 20 minutes uh, looking at how disability has transitioned away from a medicalization uh, and charity perspective to one which is rooted in the areas of social justice, recognizing the relationship between disability and human rights, and thinking more broadly about what does it mean to be a disabled person within society. And to do that, I'll talk through some key models, which I'm sure many people are either familiar with or have heard of. And we'll also think a little bit more strategically about the role of disability activism in trying to move us away from uh, a charity perspective to a, to a human rights perspective. So if we move to the next slide, please, Frank. So a good place to start is the idea of the individual model of disability. Why do we start with this? Because this allows us to understand more about how disability was perceived, represented, discussed, um, framed around the ideas of personal tragedy. So the individual is experiencing marginalization, is experiencing injustice, but much of that is explained by the idea of, well, it's a shame that you exist as an individual. And therefore, the experiences that an individual has in terms of barriers, in terms of exploitation, in terms of denied access to places, uh, oops, there we go, thank you, Frank, uh, is, is about the, the is, is located, the problems are located within the psychological and medical aspects associated with, with our understanding of disability. Most significantly then, it places the problem of barriers within the individual and then requires us to think strategically about what do we do about this. And traditionally, what has been the, the, uh, the case is there has been an attempt to view the person as a problem and, but more importantly, view the response to the person as a problem by way of a, a tragedy or charity approach. So we feel sorry, we are encouraged to pity disabled people for their experiences. We are viewed to say, well, there must be something problematic with you as an individual. And this discounts much of the wider social structures within society that may perpetuate their exper the experience of marginalization by the disabled people's community. So what I'm trying to say is, I'm trying to say lo locate the issue here within the individual model with the problem arising from the individual and the problem needing to be addressed by fixing the individual. Next slide, please, Frank. Thank you. So, of course, you have one of three options, effectively, when you locate the problem of the, with, with the individual. The first option you can take is to uh, segregate. So to remove sale people out of the, uh, out of the, the, uh, the, the the everyday life outside of, uh, move them away from the general organization of society and place disabled people in a segregated environment. One, to, and, and the justification for this is, you know, firstly, for the idea of saying, well, this person is, is too disruptive to the organization, organization of society and the functioning of society. But secondly, this person is a problem and the person therefore requires some segregated, often seen as specialist support so, so therefore the justification for removing somebody from the environment is, is justified on those, on those grounds. The other option, of course, you can do is to, is to sterilize or, um, or to uh, uh, eradicate sale people through euthanasia programs, through uh, you know, uh, selective uh, abortion uh, programs, or of course through sterilization to ensure the sale people don't continue to form relationships, uh, have, have families and, and carry on generations. Or well, the other option, of course, is to say, well, the problem resol resolves around curing the individual. And again, you can see how this is much, much tied with the idea of char charity, because often the charity approach is to say, this person's in a real difficult situation, so give us money and we will try to sort out the situation for them. Not looking at the wider social implications of their marginalization, but more focused on trying to fix the individual. And what Michael Oliver was trying to identify with the individual model approach was this emphasis on medicalization. So the, there's, there's no such thing in the writing by Oliver around the idea of a medical model. There's an individual model and a social model, which I'll come on to shortly. But within the individual model, which is, as I said before, uh, kind of uh, promoted on the basis of 
we feel sorry for the individual or the individual feels that their experience as a disabled person is one of shame, is one of pity, is one of burden. But within that perspective, within the individual model perspective, you're looking at this idea of the medicalization. So therefore, disability is, is rooted by professionals as a consequence of the way that the body functions, is a consequence of the way that the mind uh, processes information. It's very much to do with the individual, the personal. And you, as I said before, you kind of progress towards approaches of diagnosing treating and curing or sterilizing, which often is, is a tie to what charity's ambitions are and charity's aims are, or at least segregation. And what Michael Oliver and, and other disability st studies scholars and indeed activists were trying to highlight, uh, predominantly in the, in the kind of 60s, uh, 70s, 80s, and then obviously through radical disability activism, uh, 90s and, and in, the, in the 2000s, is this a way of trying to shift our thinking away from the idea that the that disability is is related to the medical condition, and is more about the social state of the way that we organise society? Now, this is important because it doesn't discount the importance of medical in, in involvement. Yeah, you know, many disabled people will, will acknowledge that we do need to rely on medical intervention. Uh, we do need to rely on medical knowledge in order to exist and survive. But the role of medical practitioners and indeed the role of health uh, professionals should be limited to just fo focusing on how the body is, is, is operating and how the body, what the body needs in order to survive. Other than that, we should be framing our thinking on disability within the way that society is, is organized. And this last point on the slide is particularly important here because the idea of medical and rehabilitation enterprises and indeed charities, traditional charities to an extent, have founded their approach to disability on the idea of normality. So the idea that there is a normal way of being and existing in the world and if you don't uh, fit into that you're seen as a disruption, you're seen as deviant and the response from the professionals and from those with considerable authority is to say you as an individual needs to change. And what the, so, what the social model is doing, if it comes to the next slide, please, Frank. What the social model is doing is trying to challenge that last, that last point. The idea, well, actually, there is no such thing as a normality in society. In fact, our bodies function all differently. There is diversity and variance in the human condition. And in order to understand the experiences that people have in everyday life, we need to focus on the barriers and the marginalization within the wider society. So this is where the social model comes into, comes into effect. And this is significant because what we're doing here with the social model is moving away from thinking about disability as a problem with the individual, but more importantly, we're starting to ask questions about, well, why do people experience barriers? If it's not due to the fact that, that their body functions in a particular way or that their mind processes information in a particular way, if it's not about pity and tragedy and charity, what is it about? And what the social model allows for is a way of describing the experience of disability by separating out, on the one hand, impairment, broadly speaking, the ideas of uh, limitations of the body or, uh, the, or kind of acknowledging how the body, uh, the human body has variance, but more importantly, looking at how disability is the social consequence of the way society is organized. So, what you're, so what's significant here is the separation of saying, well, of course, there is human variance. We all have medical conditions. We all have variance in, our, in the way that our bodies function and our minds process information. But when we experience marginalization, when we experience exploitation or denied access to services or denied support, that can't come from the way that the body functions. It must come from the way that society has decided to organize itself and the current way that society is organized. So if we go to the next slide, please, Frank. And you can see this quite well, well articulated in the uh, quote by the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation in the 1970s. Uh, this was a radical organization uh, of, of disabled people, of, and no surprise, people with physical impairments. Uh, but what was quite uh, significant here was their articulation of what disability is. And they said, and I'll read it out for access, uh, access purposes, the quote, the quote on the screen is, disability is the dis disadvantage 
or restriction of activity caused by contemporary organization, which takes little or no account of people who have physical impairments and thus excludes them from the mainstream of social activities. Now, we, can, we would argue, and, uh, and, and those within New Pius, I, I would I imagine would agree, that it doesn't, it doesn't just end with physical impairments. It transcends any impairment group and recognizes that anybody in terms of who, who identify within the neurodiverse movement, people with learning disabilities, people with mental health conditions, uh, physical impairments and so on, would all argue that the, this definition of disability aligns with many perspectives of the disabled people's community. Because what you're doing is you're acknowledging that whether it's a built environment, whether it's uh, policies and, pro and processes, implemented by the state or by those in authority or whether it's to do with people's general attitudes and the culture within society these are the reasons why disability emerges and these are the reasons why disability continues to be perpetuated so this is significant because we're now starting to use a way of describing disability that is challenging the uh, traditional ways of thinking and is moving us more towards thinking about well if people are being denied, and again, deliberately, because we have to recognize that exclusion is a deliberate um, uh, si situation that's being created by people with, with authority and people in significant positions, then what do we do to try to challenge that? And one way of doing that is to advance disabled people's rights and frame disability as an issue of human rights and an issue of social justice. Now, before I go a little bit deeper into the importance of a rights-based approach, I just want to go to the next slide, please, Frank, because I think it's worthwhile acknowledging the, uh, the contemporary approaches that, is a bit, that are being taken by um, <coughs> member states across the world, but, you know, for example, in the UK, this is very relevant. Uh, there has been a challenge to the social model, particularly by professionals and policymakers, who have tended to promote the idea of the biopsychosocial model. And I'm not going to go into too much detail now, but the reason why I'm acknowledging this is because this approach undermines the human rights of disabled people. Because effectively what it does is, it brings into question the individual's um, experiences and the individual's uh, uh, activities and thought processes and general experience of, of marginalization and calls the question, well, does the individual have responsibility for trying to address some of those barriers? Now, I would argue that the responsibility of all of us as activists is to take responsibility to highlight the injustice, the injustice of disabled people. Our responsibility is not to accept at all any conditions which say, well, perhaps we are to partially blame for our own marginalization because we don't think about things uh, in a certain way or because we accept the ideas of, of, uh, of, of exclusion and marginalization. This is deeply harmful and you can see it accelerating much through social policy across Europe. So I just wanted to be mindful of this because this will undermine a lot of disabled people's rights if it's not challenged. Next slide, please, Frank. So putting to one side the different models of disability, understanding now that we are trying to frame uh, disability as a consequence of the way society is organized, we can now start to think more strategically about how do we eradicate disabling barriers, but more importantly, advance disabled people's emancipation. On the one hand, it's important that we try to articulate the problem correctly. But on the other hand, it's important that we are creating alternatives and ideas and strategies that are not just going to identify the problem, they're also going to advance our emancipation within society. We're going to radically overhaul the way society is organized to make it more inclusive and accessible to various different groups within, within society. And a way to do that is to think, particularly in these two areas, the independent living philosophy and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I'm gonna leave independent living philosophy because I think uh, Nadia and uh, Jamie will be able to pick up on this in, in more detail and much better than the way I, I would articulate it. But what I wanna focus on is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This is important because this is a useful mechanism for understanding disability as a human rights issue. And it requires, it challenges, it demands the ideas that uh, member states should be taking responsibility to look at and uh, highlight the various ways in which society creates 
a marginalization and exclusion for disabled people. And to challenge this by not only accepting the difference uh, of, of, of disabled people and the variance within, 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 hu uh, within human life, but also to think about how do we create sustainable opportunities to allow for inclusion and, uh, and accessibility. So the, the important thing is, is to think about the human rights aspect of, of disabled people, disabled people uh, engaging within society, but to align it with the, the, the uh, ideology and the perspective of the, of the independent living agenda. Because on the one hand, you can have rights and rights are seen as a mechanism, but it's about how you describe and how you understand what disability is and how it's caused that allows for then action to be taken to, a, to dismantle many of these barriers. So the United Nations Convention is essential and a rights-based approach is essential, but it also requires an effective local, regional, national, and you know, international approach to actually create the actions on the ground that can challenge, that can move us forward, that can provide us with some ideas for uh, addressing the marginalization. And to do that, it requires Thing, you know, such as, as it requires things like the independent living approach or the independent living movement or the independent living philosophy to give us the ideas of, okay, if we recognize that disability is imposed upon us, well then what do we need to do to challenge the, challenge, challenge the idea of, uh, of, uh, of restrictions being imposed upon us, but more importantly, what are we articulating as an alternative? And that's very much where, where we move to with the disabled people's movement. If we go to the next slide, please, Frank. Because the disabled people's movement is a way to understand a collective group of people coming together with the commitment, the commonality that brings these, these you know, various different people together. And the commonality is the ideas of independent living. It's the ideas of disability as a human rights issue. It's, it's the commitment to taking a social model approach. So describing disability as a way, as a social consequence of the way society is organized. So this allows us to bring us together. So human rights is essential because within the diversity and the variance within the disabled people's community, if you say, actually, we are, we are, um, we are together on the basis of understanding disability as a social justice issue, you can bring people together irrespective of their backgrounds, irrespective of their impairments, irrespective of the, you know, the other characteristics associated with their, with their identity, such as class or uh, uh, you know, LGBTQ status or uh, you know, BAME uh, background and so on. It allows us to come together with the sole purpose of trying to advance the human rights to disabled people. If we go to the next slide, please, Frank. And this kind of touches on, you know, uh, uh, on the importance of trying to politicize the experience of disability. So on the one hand, it's important to promote rights, but it has to be, as I said before, it has to be tied to that idea of understanding what it is that we're trying to challenge and what we're trying to fight for. And that requires a, a way of, of not just challenging the tragedy and the stigma associated with the dominant ways of thinking about disability. It also is that demand to say, well, actually, as disabled people, we are usually, as Oliver says, usually portrayed as more than or less than human. Rarely are we portrayed as ordinary people doing ordinary things. And it's the idea of the ordinariness. We don't want to be perceived as different, as special, as, as, as different, so it requires segregated initiatives. We want to be seen as, as everybody else in society and recognize that we should accept diversity and difference as a, way of, of, as a way of building our society. But that requires us to think strategically about these barriers that we're experiencing. And that brings me on to my last slide, if we go to the next slide, please, Frank. It is a way of understanding what's the purpose of our activism when we align it against a, a human rights uh, perspective. And this came out of my research looking at why disabled people engage in activism. And I think you know, these, these won't be very uh, you know, surprising to many people uh, I imagine on the call, but what is important is it shows why people come together to, uh, you know, for the common reason of trying to challenge disabled people's marginalization. And people come together to you know, develop a sense of pride, to look for commonality uh, amongst, amongst the disabled people's community. And again, that commonality can come from taking a human rights approach, but can also be about trying to recognize and challenge the political and economic contributions towards marginalization. 
So again, thinking through, well, what is it within these social practices, you know, within the social structures within society that perpetuate our marginalization? And how can we go about challenging that? But it's also about not only defending our, our, our existing rights and advancing our existing rights, but it's also about trying to focus on, on allyship. And when we think about a rights-based approach, it's essential that we also think about what are we doing to develop uh, um, partnerships and allyships with others who also recognize that the way society is organized is deeply problematic and hostile to many different communities. And by looking at the platform of rights, we can say, well, it doesn't matter about our, our, the human variants. It doesn't even matter if we're talking about different communities, you know, women's liberation movements, civil people's movements. The commonality comes from recognizing that society is organized for a very deliberate purpose, for a very deliberate set of people, and it's not working for the, for the majority of people. And that's why through rights, we have a way of not only protecting what we've achieved, but we also have a platform then to build on saying, this is not enough and we need to continue moving forwards. And I think, you know, as I said before, looking at things like the independent living philosophy gives us the, the, uh, the richness of the ideas and discussion that we require in order to say, well, what we have is, not, is, is, is great, but not effective. And we now need to be moving towards radically alternative ways of organizing society of organizing our communities, but more importantly, organizing the way that we support people. And I think that's what Jamie is now gonna pick up on and take forward. Brilliant, Mira, thank you. And yes, um, indeed, this will set us up nicely for um, Jamie's presentation on uh, independent living and indeed this, um, this fight to move things forward. So Jamie, I will give you your slide and the floor is yours. Okay, coming together for change. We're going to look back at the history, theory, a little philosophy of independent living. What are we as a movement? Next slide. Um, so for the history, we're going to take a tour going from the United States to Europe, and then I'll bring it down to Sweden, looking at some of the conflicts that we have together. Just again, as um. Mira was saying it's a short time, but it'll be a fast tour along these lines. Next slide. I mean, independent living, the movement itself, two of the very important people, but I know there's many others, are Ed Roberts and Judy Human. Ed Roberts back in the 60s, 60s and Judy Human in the 70s when they became active um, in society. They wanted to come together for change, just like Mira was talking about. Ed was living in California, Judy was living in New York. Ed wanted to go to the university, which was granted as a, a right for the people, people, students to be able to go to the university free in California. And he wanted to do that as well. He wanted to go to Berkeley University. But when he came there, they said, you know, what are you doing here? A wheelchair user, um, dependent on a respirator, when you look at use, wheelchair user people, you usually think, ah, oh, they're not so intelligent. What's this guy want? So he had to make a fight to get into the university. On the other side, on the, a few years after, though, it was Judy on, in the New York area, where um, she had also gone to school, as Ed had gone to a normal, to a regular, a regular school. And, but she had to fight to be able to get her to be able to take the, um, what do you call it, to, uh, the student and to be able to graduate from the, from the high school. They were saying she hadn't finished her uh, gymnastics. She didn't have any points for that, so she couldn't get, a, get her graduation, which then would keep her away from going to the university. So both of these two, Ed wanting to get into the university and Ju Judy also wanting in, to get into the university, but actually to get the graduation status, had to go to the media, had to gather allies to make a fuss, make a noise for the human rights. Both of them won. Ed, Ed went, went, got into the Berkeley University, started something called the Rolling Quads, which they were four or five students who were all in the same situation. Since there was no place to live, they had to turn the nursing quarters into their um, the living quarters so that these guys could then uh, stay at the university and go to school. J 
Judy, she got, she was able to graduate. She went to the university. Then when she was going to graduate from the university and become a teacher, they were saying that somebody in a wheelchair can't be a teacher because you're a, a fire hazard. So again, she had to fight for a right to become a teacher. So during this time, they were fighting personal battles, but they were also get, gathering other people that were in the same situations. And you saw centers of independent living growing across the states in the 70s. Next slide. This is actually a picture, it's a painting by a guy called Patrick. Um, I didn't have the possibility of meeting Ed Roberts, unfortunately. I know some of my fellow colleagues who are older than myself uh, would have done so. I don't know if you, Miro, could have done so, but even though you're younger than myself, but anyway, I know that Ed Roberts actually came to Sweden in the beginning of the 80s, but um, I wasn't active in the movement at that time. I hadn't become disabled yet, so I didn't even know what this subject was all about. Anyway, next slide. So Ed was born in 1939. He died in 1995. He was the first student with severe impairment disability at the University of California and became a pioneering leader of the disability rights movement, the independent living movement. He had gained polio or polio at the age of 14 and 53 and became paralyzed from the neck down. Next slide. Here's a picture of Judy Human and Adolf Ratzka. Um, both these two persons are living today. They're both on the board of the Independent Living Institute where I'm the director, along with Mira, who's also on the board of the Independent Living Institute. Um, I show this picture, I want to bring out Judy. I'll talk about Adolf in a few minutes. So we'll go to the next picture. Her, oops, back. Judy was um, born 47. She also gained polio at the age of 18 months. She became one of the first teacher degree in, uh, in New York, in the state of New York. She became a lot, I, she soon left the, the teaching area and became active, both these persons became active in the disability movement, though they carried jobs. Ed became, had a job within the city of, of um, Berkeley at the time, and I think in the state of California. And Judy uh, actually was quite active in the Clinton in the Clinton administration, also the Obama administration, and worked at the World Bank. Next slide. So independent living in, in Europe. It was started there in the States with these people along with many other, uh, many, many other individuals coming together to fight for, against like what you were talking about, Miro, being seen as um, a disabled person, a, pro a problem for society, not worth to be educated, not worth to be able to get a job to, to live a life as an ordinary person. Then you had people like Adolf Ratzke from, who um, is actually from Czech, a refugee from Czechoslovakia to Germany, who went from Germany to the States and then to Sweden. So he's not Swedish, but he came to Sweden in the 80s. You had John Evans from the UK. You had Kapke Panatova from Bulgaria, Bente Skansgård from Norway, Martin Norton from Ireland. All of these peer peoples have been leaders within the independent living movement. Unfortunately, Novak, unfortunately, Bill Benta and Martin have left us um, due to, yeah, they died too, way too early as activists. But the, why, how did these gurus, well, I call them my gurus. That's because they've, they taught me when I came, found myself disabled and, and was you know, called, referring to myself as a handicapped and all of said, you're not handicapped. You know, we don't want money in the, in the cap. We, we want our rights. So these people taught me to, think differently because I mean, having been in society, never met anybody with a disability. I had my own prejudice about disability and my own um, prejudice about how was I going to become and stay an ordinary person. And it hasn't been easy. I had to fight for it. But the girls came to Europe and that's because one reason was they all, they all went to the, United, to the States for university except for Benta and because schooling wasn't accessible in Europe at the time, not as accessible. So Otto went to the States to find an accessible school where he could get an education. John the same, Kapka the same. And then when they were at the school system in the States, the universities in the States, they met up with the independent living movement, having themselves also the commonality with the independent living movement, um, a disability and a fight behind them to get to their education. They end up 
becoming, how do you say, persuaded this is the movement they wanted to join. And then they brought the, um, the independent living philosophy with them to Europe. Next slide. Here's a picture. Actually, this is a door at Inuloba, which is the center of independent living in, uh, uh, not in Oslo, but south of Oslo in Drammen, in Yuloba, where they call their office rooms out of Rutskin Jew to humans. So this is the Rutska room. Next one. And here you have a picture of Benta. Benta in the mirror, I say. I was talking to Benta and took, somebody took this picture. I don't know, must have been 10 so years ago. And so you see what Benta looks like there. Next slide. Here you have John Evans um, speaking on his assistant, holding up the mic for him, who came to the United States, started, or came back to UK from the United States and started, Miro, you could maybe help me, is it the, um, the Center of Independent Living in, in Hampshire? Or I can't remember exactly which one it was. Otherwise, we'll go on. It was one of the Centers of Independent Living, not in London, but outside of London. And beside John here, you have Bibika, who was, who is now the director of ULOBO, the Center of Independent Living in Norway, um, but who's also been a board member along with, um, along with Benta on the European Network. Next slide. Here you have a picture of um, Martin Martin and a friend of his, Mary Duffy, again, just giving you the, give, giving you the pictures of these pe people, the leaders, that have been helping us to fight our fight. Next slide. Kapke in Bulgaria, who started the Center of Independent Living in Sofia, is quite active today uh, in the fight against institutionalization, active in deinstitutionalization. Next slide. So you have the different, uh, the different people that came to Europe working working with the philosophy which actually go go forward to couple one slide more this one they were convinced of four principles or four pillars that independence stand on and that's choice control participation and inclusion that we should be able to choose uh the lives that we want to live that we should have control over these lives that we should be able to live we should be through having control and choice in our lives, we should be able to participate in society and be included in society. These were pillars that were adopted by um, groups of people who met within the independent living movement already back in the early 90s. And these would be something that you would find these principles in Article 19 of the UNCRPD that, um, that Mira was speaking about. We, say, we feel, and I think we know, that Article 19 was influenced by the independent living movement that we should have access to the living ordinary being ordinary people living ordinary lives but then being able to have access over access to services and a certain control of that through our self-determination go back one slide then again this slide is just to remind me that independent living in sweden it started with Adolf Ratzke as the as the leader coming in the seven, uh, early 80s, later, later 70s, early 80s. He had gotten a scholarship at a university here in Sweden. So he came and when he got to the university here in Sweden, he realized that it wasn't such a good country that he had thought it was going to be. He thought he would be free to go to school and do things the way he wanted to do. But then he found that the, the services, the social services, came to get him up at seven in the morning and put him to bed at 10 at night. And he said to his friends at the university, don't you guys want to go to the pub on Friday night? He had been, he had been able to use personal assistance in the States. And when he came to Sweden, he was thinking they would have such a service, but they didn't. So then he started his campaign to bring about personal assistance in Sweden. And I would say also within Europe. And he started the STEEL, which is the Stockholm Independent Living Organization a cooperative for personal assistance. He, through his work, Gil, the Gothenburg Independent Living um, Center was started. And they also, independent living influenced our very important legislation called LSS, which is services and support to some, some disabled people. 
which is considered the reform of the disabled people here in Sweden. Next slide. And one more. Mm. Excuse me, I have some water here. So, Otto Pratka defi defines independent living as having the means to have the same range of options and the same degree of self-determination that non-disabled people take for granted. And many times he says it's just we want to be ordinary human beings, living ordinary lives, being able to take the same bus that my neighbors do, go to the same school that my neighbors do, be able to get a job, to be able to live in a family and not being put into an institution. Next slide. Um, this is just a funny slide on discrimination accessibility by one of my favorite, unfortunately also not living anymore, John Callahan, who is himself was disabled and was a cartoonist. And he's taking a shower, his, in this picture someone's taking a shower and the manager saying, as a manager, I promise you, I will find an accessible bathroom. Next slide. Uh -huh. So within independent living, I mean, I started, I, I missed one slide here, which I have, let's see if I can find it here on my own. Um, back in the, hang on for a second. Um, back in 1990, there was a meeting. I think uh, Nadia will talk more about how in, uh, email became. But at one meeting in the 90s, there was um, in the Netherlands, a group of people got together and they adopted principles for the European Network on Independent Living, where in these principles, um, there was many of those which you've talked about, Miro, that independent living meant to be able to participate equally in the society, exercising self-determination, that we should raise consciousness of the situation of, of disabled people for empowerment and emancipation to achieve equal opportunities, and rights and full participation. And that's through control in, in the process of living individually and collectively as disabled people. We work with peer support, democratic principles, and independent living was to be across disability. We don't care people what the diagnosis of somebody is. What we're looking at is human rights of disabled people, where we're defining our own needs and our choices and the degree of the user control within our, within our, our, our um, services. That we oppose um, separate situations, whether it's uh, transportation for disabled people or institutionalization, we want to be part of the mainstream and not something that's special. We, believe, we know that it's important for research and our development and in planning and decision-making at all levels. So these principles were already adopted in the 90s. Okay, um, let's see back to my slides here. Within the moment, we have some smaller conflicts and usually around things like personal assistance. Some countries will start their, per, their legislation for personal assistance and they'll exclude people with intellectual disability. This was the case in Finland, for example, where if you're basing your, your legislation on independent living, it should be including all persons with disability and looking at the need of the individual and not on the diagnosis of the person. Another conflict that comes up, should relatives of persons with disability be able to work as a personal assistance, for example? In Bulgaria, they would say no. And in Sweden, they would say definitely yes. There's reasons behind these. I won't go into them and take that time now. Next slide. Uh, challenges or attitudes of people towards us, but not only the attitudes of people towards us, but also our own attitudes and um, seeing ourselves as full, as, as um, having rights and being able to live fully within society. The, empower, the empowerment of us and all of our members within the movement so that we are strong individuals fighting and claiming our rights. The challenge is, I mean, everybody, all the countries have signed the UNCRPD that you talked about, Miro, but now we want it to be implemented and really implemented. When we talk about real personal assistance and not fake personal assistance. Involvement of the youth, because I'm getting old, we're getting old, and young people need to come over and take this movement forward, because I don't think we're gonna reach our rights in my lifetime anyway. 
portability of services. Today with Corona, I'm not sure we're gonna even gonna be able to have portability of services at all. But anyway, we believe in the portability of being able to, uh, I should be able to apply for a job in Brussels and get the job, but that's not the case today as a user personal assistant. Nothing about us without us, strong, strong, invisible is one of the strongest motives as far as I'm concerned in our fight for independent living. Next slide. Mobility and freedom, being able to move from one country to the next, live in one country to the next. Next slide. <coughs> That's all for me. Thank you very much. These were all your slides indeed, Jamie, and, and thank you very much uh, on time as well. Um, and uh, now we go to, to Nadia, who will tell us now a bit more about, uh, so we've heard, heard from Miro and Jamie about um, the, the more the, the theory and, and the principles, and now Nadia will tell us about how ANIL actually came into uh, existence. Uh, so uh, Nadia, uh, the, the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Well, after those words, uh, all the good explication that we heard from Jamie and Miro, I will just uh, give a little bit an overview about how ENIL started. Uh, we heard already that uh, in 1989, some very uh, independent living activists, they came together in Strasbourg and they had a conference about personal assistance already in that time. And so uh, from that moment, we considered that ENIL started. So uh, that's why we celebrated also or 20, uh, 20th anniversary last year. And um, there was also at the same time a, a, a form of registration in Stockholm where the statues were also drawn up. And that's the basic uh, constitution of ENIL. And then as we heard already, in 1919, uh, all those activists met again in the Netherlands and um, in August, and so they, they adopted principles of independent living. There were guidelines. They said that white persons with disability use the term independent living. Our goal is to participate equally in our communities, exercising our self-determination. And I really find it amazing, me personally, that those people without the CRPD, without any other uh, study that has been realized of anything, they, they could in that time already, they know very clear what they wanted, you can go to the next slide, uh, what they wanted to be able uh, and to be able to live at, on equal basis as the other. So that's why I was stopping by the independent living basic principles that they use. And already in that time, so it was a little bit revolutionary because now, look, we are in 2020 and we are still struggling with the terminology of a lot of those things. But while it was very, very clear for them that they wanted that independent living as a process of consciously raising empowerment and emancipation, and that this process enabled all disabled persons to achieve equal opportunities, rights, and full participation in all aspects of society. So it was, <laughs> so the, the CRPD and all the other uh, definitions came just to uh, reinforce what they already adapted in that time. So uh, Jamie gave a well in overview, but I really find it important to see how the basics from uh, what we use now, uh, the international conventions were already in that time adopted by those independent living activists in, in 1919. So they said also at that time they they highlighted that it's for all type of disabled people. They also say that they can control and, and the support that is needed individually and collectively when they needed it. So to be more mainstreaming. So, and also they spoke already about peer support and, and democracy in the principle. And that's why voting and having a vote, you know, we only had general common seven where um, and, and disabled person organizations is unrecognized a 51% of the, of, the, of the board of the decision-making uh, organ in the organization is persons with disability themselves. But look, if you look at, at that time, that um, the, 
the email uh, activists had already that, that to take control and to guide the life that they wanted themselves. And already from that time, even they, they wanted to have access to uh, the basics of life. And they really highlighted, at that time also, the right to sexuality and the right to marry, to have children, right of peace, access to physic uh, physical and cultural environment. So I found it very important to put them once again in front of all of us. But I will not go um, through them all, except if you have any question about it. So the next slide is just to continuously about those seven principles. And, and they really say in that time that independent living uh, is, the, is uh, the independent living movement is opposed to development and maintains of systems which promote dependency through institutional responses. So they were already were working on deinstallation. So it's up to us now to, to take those missions over. So we go to next slide and we go back to uh, 1989. So on October the 29th, Ineos registered as a trading company in Dublin, in Ireland, on the request of the board in that time. And it was operated from the Center of Independent Living, Bray, in that time. So they hosted the meeting. And so the proposal of that uh, to register Enio as a legal entity was to secure funding from Europe, but also to be recognized uh, as a legal organization to be a potential partner when there's any uh, involvement in, in, on policy level, but also with other stakeholders within the society. And why Ireland? And so in that time, it was both easier and quicker and cheaper to register a company in Ireland. And also there was very good support of, of a lot of Irish activists. And we had a lot of uh, Irish uh, board members since then. And especially in that time, there was uh, an author or daily that I haven't known, sadly enough, who was really a guy who helped Emil to get a lot of funding. And also in that time, Ireland was supposed one of the rural areas of Europe. And so the European funding was easier to get. There are two pictures on this slide. You can see that um, uh, John Adams, you can see also a part of Kafka at that time. Uh, for joining that conference in London uh, in, 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 in 89. And we have another picture where we can see all the independent living activists in Tenerife in 2003. We can see John Adams, we, we can see also our Gratka, we can see the Newman, and a lot of others that maybe uh, Jamie uh, knows. But it is good to see at that time how motivated they were and how they stamp things out of the ground for what they became now. And go to the next now. So in 2005, the Valencia government agreed with EMU, and especially uh, it was thanks to the involvement of John Adams and afterwards Manuel Rabato to provide the core funding for EMU to start off in Valencia, in, in, in Valencia EMU office and a secretary over there for a period of three years with two conditions that Emil would have a branch in Valencia with staff who was really working there and also that it would be um, um, a secretary of Emil. So it was like a move of all the activities from Dub that were guided from Dublin to Valencia at that time. But it was a little bit ambiguous in that time because uh, the company was registered in Dublin but most of the activities were happening in Spain. And also the audit was done according to the Spanish requirements. And then once again, so it was double work, the audit was also supposed to be done in Dublin to the Irish requirements. So there were a lot of difficulties in, in after a few years. So the executive director, he resigned. But most, uh, the biggest problem was the misunderstanding of independent living among the group of the supporters in Valencia itself. And also people were a lot encouraged and motivated, but sadly enough, there was a lack of management experience. So uh, the, the Valencian 
office, stay calm for a while. You can go to the next slide. So Martin Noten ended up to be the uh, interim executive director of Enio because he was guiding from, from Dublin during those, that whole period. Um, uh, so he was based in, in, in Dublin. He was traveling a lot to Valencia and trying to manage those things from, different, uh, from distance. It was not so easy. So there we hired Jamie who came in as a part-time executive director and they share both uh, the position of executive director for a while. And there was also a group and German team with uh, Hubert Christian and Debbie Julie from the UK, who were also working in 2009 uh, from Germany to support again email activity elsewhere in Europe. And then we had um, email office uh, in, in Valencia. So in 2011, the Valencian agreement ended up because it was uh, at the beginning a three-year project, but it had prolongation. But the office was closed down definitely in 2011. And so um, afterwards in 2012, there was a new staff, an email office back in Dublin, where we had Mladen and Vanessa working there at that time. We had Enos uh, working from London and Jamie from Sweden. You can go to the next slide, please. So then in 2014, the board who was at that time um, with the president Vibeka, from Iloba, we had Kafka on the board, we had Mimi, we had Paul Fagan from Ireland, not myself, we had Peter Lambert, Debbie Jolie, we had Mira on that time, and Germain Tosi. So the, that actual board, they took the decision to move to Brussels in June when we had a face-to-face -face meeting and drama in Iloba. And then most of the people say, why Brussels? Like we know now from experience, that uh, all, most of the European institutions are based in Brussels and also all the human rights organizations and the social platforms were over here. So networking and handling advocacy were more uh, easy in Brussels itself because in that time, everybody needed to travel from uh, everywhere from uh, Europe to come to Brussels to attend. So it was not easy to follow up and also to do networking, it was, it was not so evident and it was costly because uh, we were hiring, people were traveling and then people were staying in, in, in hotels. So there was a lot of cost linked also to it. And sometimes you miss opportunities because there were last minute uh, uh, meetings that we couldn't attend because we had nobody present to do it and we, were, we didn't have any staff we could follow those things up. So um, the decision was done. And, he, and also it was all, one of the, uh, the main challenges was also that when uh, we had members visiting uh, Brussels uh, at that time, and they wanted to visit email, it was difficult to move again from Brussels to Dublin to, to meet with the staff. While now, when people come to Brussels, they can easily just drop in and meet with the staff or organize other meetings together with the staff. So that was, uh, they were, those were the biggest uh, arguments to bring, uh, to, move, to move email from Dublin to Brussels. And so, next slide please. In 2015, email was created and renamed uh, the email office in your Brussels office. So it was registered as a non-profit organization uh, within, uh, and the constitutions were registered at the Belgian Monitor. And we have the office that we still have now, Amun Yuji. And then we had a very big team because we had at that time still the financing of the European um, Commission. So we had Ines still was working from London and sometimes Lily also. We had Deliana, who was working from Sofia. We had Jamie from Sweden, and we had Marco and Frank from Brussels. And so the same month that Frank started, for example, we organized the Freedom Drive 2015. So uh, the last slide is just 
the strategic plan of Inyo and where we and and all the points where we are working on. So we are still working on. Um, maybe I will leave the opportunity uh, to questions. So uh, it's very uh, clear where we are working on for the moment. And if there are any questions, um, don't hesitate. I think it's, it's, it's nicer if we can speak directly. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nadia. Um, and yes, that was very well on time. So now we still have a lot of time for, for questions. So um, I suggest if, if any of you has uh, questions, just type them in the, in the chat box or um, raise your hand and I can unmute you. Yes, there is already a, a, a raised hand by Julius. So uh, thanks, Julius. I will unmute you now. And here we go. Thank you, Frank, for giving me the opportunity. I have a few questions uh, beginning from the first speaker. I would like to know from him the twelfth pillar of the independent living, because in the definition, he talks only about two dignity and freedom. But uh, Jamie gave a quite clear definition to my mind with four, which is choice, control, participation and inclusion. So in his in a short word, can he define to me what is independent living and the twelfth pillar? And then uh, in owing to Jamie's presentation, there is one thing, uh, freedom of movement, which does not apply to everyone. I take for example uh, refugees and asylum seekers with disability. Uh, a good example with Norway and Britain, where they don't accept water refugees like this other person. So is there any strategy, any put it in place to do something about this? Uh, thank you. I could answer those, Frank. Yes, go ahead, Jamie. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I think the best definition of independent living is the one that Radzka said, which was in my slide, of having the same range of options as other people. It's being, it's being able to live as an ordinary person. Then you have the principles. I, I brought out four of the principles where you have, um, where you have uh, in this 1990 decision, I think there were 12, or at least Miro talked to 12, some of the different CILs define it differently. But when Adolf Ratsky gives a short one, he says independent living means to have the same range of options, the same degree of self-determination the non-disabled people take for granted. And if you had that same uh, range of options and the same degree of self-determination, then you would be able to live um, in, in a society with choice and control for participation and inclusion. That I think Miro can give you maybe even a more academic definition, but I'll go from there to why I brought up uh, the freedom of movement, that's one of the issues that we work with. I wasn't maybe very clear when I showed the slide. Uh, it's one of the issues we work in the email works or the independent living movement works towards uh, deinstitutionalization. We believe there should be no institutions and we also believe that in freedom of movement. And as you say, it's not, there is not uh, the freedom of movement today. When it comes to the refugee, that's one situation. When it comes to disabled people, I mean, Europe was considered to be, the EU was considered to be a peace project, but also where there's a freedom of movement within the country, where we found other people, other citizens could move from one country to the next where we could not. And now it's being very much um, taken to another extreme when it comes to the issue of um, immig uh, immigrants, yes. Are you happy for me to say something, Frank? Yeah, I was just going to ask if, if you uh, had something to, to add to this as well. Uh, not drastically. I, I think, yeah, I, I completely agree with, with Jamie's uh, assessment for the definition of independent living. I suppose, you know, to add, it's, I, well, from a superficial point of view, it, it's essentially having the right level. Of, it's have, about having the right level of support to do the things you want to do with your life. So it's not about... Um, trying to make do with what you have 
And uh, so often we see from professionals and service providers, they try to ask people, well, what do you want to do? And then they try to limit or restrict their ideas or opportunities or preferences, preferences with what they want to do with their life in order to align it with the existing support available. So independent living is more about the kind of creativity of options about saying, well, we've, we start with the individual, we understand what the individual wants, we understand how uh, there are many people who are non-disabled, um, who take you know, numerous opportunities uh, throughout their life at different stages of their life. And the question is, why should that be uh, supported and afforded to disabled people? Another thing I would just add is you can see how independent living has been hijacked and changed throughout the years. And there are many, there are many people who have highlighted this within, the, within disability studies and indeed within the disability activism, uh, sorry, disability uh, civil people's movement. And the concern is that when you have um, what we refer to as a neoliberal society, where the individual has to take responsibility for themselves on everything, and therefore, if you can't do something, it must be, there must be something wrong with you and you have to try and change. What happens is the independent living idea becomes corrupted because policymakers and parliamentarians will adopt it. But what they actually mean is self-sufficiency. So they try to hijack a term and try and change it to mean doing things for yourself on your own. And of course, outside of the, uh, outside of the people's experiences, there is nobody who is constantly demanded to show that they are self-sufficient and yet for disabled people engaged with services there's always this question of well you need to use services to become more self-sufficient i think just my final point on this would be what the independent living uh, philosophy provides is a recognition that we are all interdependent in society we all rely on others as much as they rely on on, on us so within that we recognize that we do need support from others in order to do the things we want to do with our life, just as much as anybody, disabled or non-disabled, requires some sort of support to do the things that they want to do with their life. Nobody in the entire world is truly independent because you can't do things for yourself on your own. You always rely on other people. But what independent living philosophy is important about is saying actually it's about requiring us to have the right level of support and have those opportunities that others have taken for granted. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Miro um, and Jamie. Um, does this answer uh, your question, Julius? Um, or then we can, yeah, oh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then we go to the to the next uh, question from Laura, and uh, after that we have uh, Mariana also with with a question. Uh, so the question from Laura is in the in the chat, and it's a question for for Nadia, but maybe other people can can add with as well. I like this time also. Uh, the question is, um, I'm intrigued. You say there was a misunderstanding of independent living by the Valencia team. Um, in which way did they misunderstand independent living? So um, maybe Nadia, you can start, and then if uh, um, Jamie or, or Miro wants to add something uh, after that, then uh, Miro and Jamie can add. Um, okay. Um, so the understanding of um, uh, of the uh, philosophy behind independent living was quite different. For example, people could um, easily, Ali, um, I can have just one example. One of the person, Ali, the supporters or in Valencia, he find it okay when uh, he shared, for example, he had a an, an family service who was coming at his place and he couldn't choose what time the, the, the person was coming and which, uh, which person was coming. And for him, that was a part of, of independent living because he was living by mm -hmm. and in his own apartment. That's not the same. Independent living is not because you're living in your own apartment that you are satisfied and, and that's independent living. Independent living is that you can choose by yourself who's coming to support you and when he's coming to support you. I, I'm speaking about the idly way, but he was even, uh, uh, they were even not uh, speaking about the ideologic way that you can choose by yourself who's coming to support you, where and where you live. And so, um, yeah, it was also, um, and, and in conflict and 
and, 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 and lobbying. That was very difficult because as leader organization on independent living and the role that EMIL play, plays with, within uh, the European um, political participation, for example, you cannot go and say from sometimes, yeah, for some people in the independent living is okay and for others not. No, it's for uh, uh, every person with disability. Maybe Jamie, you can, um, you can clarify more. I can give you another example, for example, if we see that uh, the, here in Belgium, uh, the National Council, they took a position on the recommendation uh, on the general comment number five, because for, for them, uh, they don't agree about the fact that we should not live inside an institution. They say that everything is based on, as we say, you may have the right to choose. If somebody wanted to choose to live in an institution, go out during the day, work, and coming back at night, so that's also a kind of independent living. But at night, he cannot do whatever he wants. He cannot eat on the time he wants in that institution. He cannot choose the person who's coming and help him and, and support him. So it's, it's not the kind of independent living that we are supposed to promote. So it was in, in that order. Uh, you asked me to add something. I mean, back when I came to Valencia, I think more, I mean, I was the director when we actually moved back to Dublin and also the director when we moved from Dublin to Belgium. I mean, at the time, as from working as the organization, the main problem we had was finding people who could speak English that we could work with. So that was mainly the people. There were, when we come through the movement in different countries and we meet one another, depending on where we are in our thinking, and I think our independent living training, we can have different stands. One issue in Spain we did meet was there was two persons who started doing training for personal assistance, um, a formal training, but they were doing it themselves. And then they were able to, part of the trainings was that the people were being trained, then worked as personal assistants for the people giving the courses. And this was a very good way of, fight, of getting personal assistance, which was quite lacking in, in, um, in Spain. But this led to one personal assistant taking that idea even more formally, saying that you need to have a college education in order to become a personal assistant. And this is something we've been quite against from the very beginning when it comes to training our personal assistants in the movement. Because we say that we ourselves are the experts and we can do the training. I don't need somebody that has a two-year college education to become a personal assistant. One of my best personal assistants was a guy who came, had been working in the metal factory and wanted to do something different and ended up becoming my assistant and liked the job very much. I did the training. He found out what it was to be a personal assistant about independent living through working with me. So that was one issue that I did meet in Spain where we had some difference in opinion at least, but I don't know if that really answers the question. Um, I think there were um, great um, explanations and great examples as well. Um, Laura, if you if you have any follow-up questions, then please feel free to type them in the chat. No, the answers to the questions were well. Okay, thanks. So, yes, that were good uh, uh, replies. Uh, so now we go to Mariana, who has a question. Um, who will, will just do it in, while speaking. So I will unmute you now, uh, Mariana. Do you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, hi. Um, so um, what we see from a history of um, independent living movement, it's, it was initiated by um, persons with physical disability and it determined its philosophy, strategy, approach. Even this motto um, of social model, nothing about us without us, it's very much applicable to this kind of disability which is not concerned by absence of legal capacity, absence of free freedom of choice. And um, as time, um, is going by and today what I observe I'm a French living in Ireland so I see these two countries 
and in both uh, the movement of uh, physically disabled persons. Of course, they have a lot of challenges still, but there is steady, small progress. At least they start to be visible, but it's not um, the case of the persons with several um, intellectual disability, psychosocial disability, autism, especially autism. And they are not represented in any instances, even the only um, forum of disabled, intellectual disabled persons in Ireland was um, closed recently because they hadn't no subvention, I think, and in France it's even worse. So my question would be uh, how uh, the ANIL and um, uh, I don't know, on another instances, local um, advocacy, how uh, they think or they already address this problem of under or not representativity of those people who can't maybe represent themselves. Sometimes the disability is so severe they can't. So maybe this motto, nothing about us without us, doesn't apply to them. And how to really extend to those people this um, philosophy and battle for independent living. I can say something. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Um, when it comes to independent living, we do believe in cross disability. I mean, I know that I've talked about quite a few persons that have some sort of a mobility import and impairment, the, which there's quite a few that are the strong persons in the movement. When it comes to people who can't make decisions on themselves, we believe in assisted decision making to be able to make those decisions. And within you have one organization in Sweden, which is called JAG, J A G. It's an independent living organization which is targeting persons with multiple disability and intellectual, um, intellectual disabilities where they are the leaders within that organization and they are members within EMIL as well and have many times been um, represented in making speeches at different, different events. I do, I do understand on one hand we have the problem in society of the, of the this, this, what is it called, the this, this survival of the fittest or something like that. It's not always been easy to get your voice heard and you have to fight all the time. But, um, and I would say there is representation within, within the independent living in email, though it tends to be a high representation of people with mobility impairments. Anybody else wants to add on this um, question as well? I can, I can add to them, Frank. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so it is, it's right to acknowledge that much of the development within the disabled people's movement has typically been led by people with physical impairments. It's also you know, important to recognize that the majority of uh, the early um, progress made by disabled people was, was also often by white male uh, individuals with physical impairments. So there has, there has been a, a need to look at the diversity within disability activism and look at the diversity within the decision making and influential positions within within disability activism the problem that we've had i think as a movement is that we've struggled so often to get our voices heard that when we do have a small opportunity to have a voice heard we tend to uh, rely on those who are easily accessible and those who are often mm -hmm. being used to having positions or a platform to advance their thoughts. So I think this, this, this really important point kind of speaks to, to a number of issues. One is how do we diversify the disability activism and the work that we're doing and not only uh, look for engaging with specific groups of people, but actually just recognizing that we need to do more to bring in not just new newcomers, but those who are, who are disabled people, um, you know, irrespective of background, but are going through a journey of politicizing their experiences. And that also requires us to think more about how we can uh, challenge gently some of the work by traditional parent-led groups or groups that have often tended to speak on behalf of certain communities 
and certain groups within the disabled people's community. Everybody has a voice, and everybody can be represented if the support is provided to the person which is most in an accessible way and that we change our practices in the way that we either collect information or in the way that we articulate and, and place demands on certain groups. And I think you've seen this a little bit within the neurodiverse movement. Um, and you can see you know, in the UK and in America, uh, to an extent, opportunities where activists are politicizing their experiences of neurodiversity and, and using the social model in, in such a way. And again, you know, people like Peter Beresford as well has been influential um, in using this, the social model to explore the ideas of mental health. And which is often still trapped in that idea of um, of cure and rehabilitation and prevention methods, rather than rec recognizing people who have survived um, the you know, people who call themselves mental health survivors uh, of, of of practitioners and so on. So more is needs to be done with that. But I think there are sporadic groups out there who are politicizing their experiences of disability. But we need to do more as either as organisations, but also as individuals embedded within disability activism to reshape the way that we strategize and campaign and reshape the way that we engage with those who for many years have been denied a voice not just by the systems and structures but have also been denied the voice by fellow disabled people okay uh, thanks thanks miro um i think um, this was um so, so some good remarks and i also have a related to Mark here in the chat by, uh, by Des. Uh, and after that, we still have a question from Greece as well. But uh, I'm going to start with, with Des because I think it's, it's related. Um, so Des writes, uh, remarks for everyone. I have autism. This disability isn't visible to the outside. Uh, that means problems to enter in most organizations for disabled people. Some people don't believe that I have a disability because I speak normal. Some people find me um, too critical and too smart, for instance, too much rules and too childish activities. Um, some people want that I enter for organizations for, mental, for mentally disabled people, like Down syndrome, but I don't feel good in these groups <coughs> um, because I am there uh, a victim um, for um, sexism, uh, especially from the disabled men. Um, there are too much rules and um, I too got a bore, a bore out from activities because they are too, e too easy uh, for me. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. Um, I have been writing my remarks about autism. Uh, thank you. So um, thanks for the, for the remarks, Tess. I, um, it, um, thank you for, for sharing your experience. Uh, I don't think there is a, a question in there, but it's it's um, indeed you you also point out the the problem, similar to how um, Miro pointed out that uh, in for in, in some ways there are still the the barriers that we see in society in general. We we also see uh, to an extent in the disability movement, and we we indeed need still to to work on it. Um, in the to 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 get it um to yeah, well to to really make make the movement also inclusive uh, and and easily uh, reachable for for everyone and of course the philosophy uh, more known but uh, thanks these these were um great uh, remarks and i think really uh, fitting as well to to the earlier question um so unless um anybody wants to to add something on this, I think that this um, brings us nicely to the next question of uh, of Spiros. So, is anybody wanting to add something? Uh, no. Okay. So the question from Spiros actually builds on this a bit uh, because uh, Spiros asked. Um, he he likes to ask. He says probably Nadia. Um, what is the spread of the indep independent living philosophy? to EU member states and to the rest of Europe. Is there a plan of including independent living in every political agenda of any European and national party? If that happens, um, how can people be protected, um, whether they're disabled or not, from misinformation on the subject, um, similar to what happened in, in Valencia? Um, 
thanks again, uh, Spiros. Okay. So um, the question I think, Nadia, is um, mm -hmm. how can we work on more spreading the information better, making it more accessible so that everybody has a has a good understanding of, of independent living and, and uh, what we mean? Maybe on two levels. Uh, one, one is about uh, informing and uh, do more sensibilization about uh, independent living, what it means uh, in your produce the meat busters about independent living, about all the prejudice to try to, uh, to overcome also all the barriers on uh, to realize independent living also. But on the other side, in, uh, the independent living now, uh, most of the time on European level is linked to deinstitutionalization because they say if you want to realize independent living, you should uh, uh, deinstitutionalize people. But sadly enough, in a lot of uh, European member states, there was still a lack of plans, strategic plans to do that transition from uh, institutional care to uh, community based. So, um, yeah, the, real the reality is that it's, it's, yeah, it's still not um, really introduced uh, in the political agenda. There are some, uh, in you, for example, we have a campaign about the right use of uh, European structural investment funds so that it doesn't go uh, to new buildings or to collective care settings. And uh, we try to uh, encourage that they include person assistance services. So um, we try to lobby a lot on it. But um, on the other hand, we still need to have more and more uh, activists that use the terminology in the, in the right way because a lot of inclusion now, everything uh, we have, for example, in some member states, they build small group houses who are inclusive because they are part of a neighborhood. <laughs> and, people, and people even don't get out of it, but they call it inclusive. And, and they say that it's, it's uh, to encourage independent living so I think it's really uh, something um, important that we keep on uh, clarifying that what independent living means for us and, and uh, how we can implement it on the agenda. So that's why uh, Ine was not start, uh, stopping uh, repeating herself each time when there is new, they are now working on new strategic disability plan, how to include independent living in it on all areas but it's still a big, uh, a big struggle because again, some people put budgets on it as a reason or as a uh, as a not good reason. But it's still, yeah, it's still not spread as something normal because people have are in some conference zones and we are still living with more than one million people who live inside institutions without speaking of those who are in their own apartment or in their family. And they cannot get out of it because lack of services, lack of knowledge about their rights, lack of um, uh, access to budgets to realize this. So it's still a big struggle, sadly enough. Yeah. They, um, they, thanks, Nadia, for for the for, for the for the reply. I think you are you are absolutely right. Also, in in saying that, wow, we we have well the. Well, we uh, I think also we re repeat several times the the same thing, and uh, uh, the the thing is also that Miro mentioned in the beginning that the concept of independent living sometimes is also used in in in, in political plans, as as um, uh, was was pointed out, um, but that. Um, when they when sometimes independent living is used it is used in a in a wrong way it is used in a way to kind of cut all social services but then say like okay now we are uh, promoting uh, in, independent living so there we see also this this um this this problem and of course um to um you know uh, include it in, in, in the different political agendas. This is also something that we that we try to do when we, for instance, gave, gave feedback to the uh, European election with our annual manifesto. Um, but unfortunately, while in some groups inclusion was taken as a topic, like in some European political groups, um, also there the problem is, I think that um, 
while there were sometimes in the European groups political um, manifestos, nobody in the national level reached them. So you know <laughs> there is still the 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 the, the gap between the public opinion uh, in in different European countries. So that that I think is also something that uh, is still in the way of a common understanding, as I think you you mean, uh, Spiros. Um, but of course, we are working towards that, as as Nadia said. Um, is there anybody wants to add something to to this? Um, still, because we're getting um, towards the end of our time. But uh, if if somebody still wants to add something or has uh, some other questions, feel please uh, feel free. I will interpret this 25 seconds of silence as a um, uh, no. <laughs> so um, then I think we can uh, bring the webinar to a close. Um, thank you. Thank you all for, for being here, for listening, for asking questions. Um, and of course, thank you to to, to Nadia, to Jamie, and to, to Miro for their uh, excellent presentations. And um, as I said, the um, the uh, uh, Zoom session here is recorded, so we we will be sharing, especially also with you, the the recording. And uh, you should have already received the the PowerPoint from from Ines, so uh, this you also have. Uh, and on this slide here, the last slide of this PowerPoint, you will find all the email addresses. Um, so if you have any further questions or want to talk about uh, something more, uh, then feel free to, to, to contact us as well. Um, and so yes, apart from that, I would say um, uh, thank you. And it is good to, to meet all on, on the on the Zoom, especially now since we all have to stay inside for the coronavirus. It's good to also have something yeah. nice to talk about. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, good luck um, everyone and see you uh, next time. Yeah, thanks everybody. See, thank you you. On, see you on the web. Bye. Bye-bye.